Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome to the latest, the post-international break edition of the Gary Neville podcast. Gary, we've watched a, a game here of two tones, I called it in the commentary, between Liverpool and Leeds United. Uh, one facet of the game was uh, showing off Liverpool really at their best, then we had the injury. So how best to describe it from your point of view? Yeah, I think the first part of the match, before Liverpool got into the stride, it was scintillating, it was breathtaking for 10 minutes. The pace that it was in the game, Leeds were creating a couple of good chances, atmosphere absolutely electric. Um, but then the quality and composure of Liverpool's midfield, Fabinho, Elliott, who will come on to speak about in a bit, obviously, and Thiago, just, I think, meant that they had more. And Liverpool's front players are better than Leeds' players. And it was a brilliant performance in the first half from Liverpool. Should have been well ahead. Well, 1-0 really did flatter Leeds. Uh, and Marco, Marcelo Bielsa, I called him Marco during the game as well, Marcelo Bielsa will have been, I think, Delighted to only be 1-0 down at half-time. It was a fantastic performance. And it's been a good start to the season. Everyone's talking about Cristiano Ronaldo, Manchester United. And we will as well. Yeah, yeah. And, Manchester United, and Manchester City, obviously, champions. Uh, Chelsea signing Lukaku. So everything's been away from Liverpool and questioning whether Liverpool's team is over the hill. And this Liverpool team that Jurgen Klopp's had is past its best. But it was a really good performance. They did everything that they were asked to do before the game you sometimes think, well, do you need to fight fire with fire against Leeds and match their energy? So when you see Elliot, who were Elliot and Thiago and Fabinho in midfield, who maybe aren't the most athletic and mobile, even though they can run, but they're not the most athletic and mobile. You could have played Kaita, uh, Milner and Henderson, who'd probably run more. You think, well, maybe Leeds have got a chance to run off them. It was said in the studio as well, I think, but it was the composure. It reminded me of sometimes Scholes at Anfield when the game was so frantic and all of a sudden there was a small guy in the middle of the pitch who just put his foot on it and think, oh, there's calm, there's peace. Carrick would do the same for us at Manchester United. And I think what Thiago did for Liverpool today was what he was brought in to do. And when it's frantic around, everyone's sprinting around and everyone's desperate and it's 100 miles an hour, put your foot on the ball and play the pass that just opens the game up. And he did that. And Salah and Mane were fantastic. I say Mane, Mane was erratic in his finishing. Salah was very good in terms of the way in which he yeah, played the game. Yeah, he's joined the 100 club. We, we must pay tribute to that. The 30th player to reach 100 Premier League goals. And here we are at the start of the 30th season. Uh, Martin, when he came back uh, to Liverpool, I'd seen him obviously play over the years. I never thought for one second we were going to see this player emerge that we've seen at Liverpool. I don't think anybody could. And then when he did it for the first season, you thought, well, you know, it's a one-off. Second season, you're thinking... Mm, now you recognise he's one of the real great Premier League forwards. Uh, he's not a striker, but he is in some ways. But he plays off that sort of right-hand side, coming in on his left foot. You sometimes think, like Mares, well, he's quite predictable in what he does. You know what he's going to do next, but you can't stop it. You can't stop it. He's that brilliant. He's... We talk, we're going to talk about Cristiano Ronaldo in a bit, being single-minded to score goals. And that's what Salah is. He's single-minded, more single-minded than Firmino and Mane. And at times that brings in maybe a little bit of criticism that is he selfish, but he's not. He's absolutely outstanding. And I think out of all the Liverpool players on the pitch, Van Dijk would be the one that you'd say, how would you replace him? But I think he'd be the next. Well, we have to talk about Harvey Elliott. Um, obviously uh, an 18-year-old. Uh, with great promise, he's worked his way into the team this season, had a spell on loan at Blackburn last season and did very well. Um, and he was, as you've just said, doing extremely well in this Premier League game against a difficult opponent. And we don't know what's happened yet, but we, we do fear that it, it'll be a serious, uh, serious news when we do get the details. Yeah, it looked bad. And um, Jurgen Klopp played him in the game with Chelsea. There was an element of shock that he'd been picked in that game. Mm. He then goes and plays him again today against Leeds in a hostile away game against you know an opponent that we're always going to make it very difficult and we're going to demand a lot of him. And he stepped up to the task like you wouldn't believe in the games. I've been really impressed. Sometimes you think about young players putting them in big games, but I have to say he's been fantastic. And then that horror moment, not a horror tackle. I don't think it was a horror tackle. I'll say that again. We saw it again on the uh, monitor that the VAR were checking. And... It was a, a sprint back by Stroik. It was an attempt to try and reach for the ball and get sort of wrap his foot around it. And I think he does that. But I think it's his other leg that lands on the trailing ankle of Harley Elliott, Harvey Elliott that means that there is pressure on it. He falls on it. And, and it didn't look particularly nice. In fact, it wasn't nice. We know it wasn't nice. And we saw actually a replica of it with uh, Liam Cooper 
on Salah, I think it was, and uh, it didn't, um, you know, it didn't have an injury, and nobody was calling for. Uh, uh, of course, the referees have to factor everything into it, but. Would it have been a red card without the injury? No, I don't no. think it would have been a yellow card without the injury potentially. No. Maybe because of the angle of the challenge. Uh, I think Jurgen Klopp, you know, he did um, say a couple of weeks ago that he was concerned about the aggression coming back into the tackling, and we'd all said it was a fantastic thing. I don't think that was a a tackle that you wouldn't see a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, 15 years ago. I think it was a tackle that, to be fair, no one would say. As a professional player, ex-professional player, you know a bad one and you know one that's you know, a genuine attempt to play the ball and actually does play the ball and one that you'd make yourself. And that, I felt, was a tackle that every defender, every attacker, and we saw another one, as you say, mm. Cooper on Mane. It was Mane, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah 10 yeah. minutes later, that was very similar. Mm. That, again, no one would whinge about, complain about. I'm sure there are Liverpool players that you can think of that would tackle in that fashion many times uh, and it's just an outcome that no one wants you know we've all been here in stadiums or played in games where there's been a bad injury uh, I was actually talking about it on Friday night when I was asked a question about which player did I play with that I felt didn't achieve what he should have done in the game and it was Ben Thornley uh, who I played with in uh, you know, 1992 was a well, youth team player with us and he got a bad cruciate injury from a really bad tackle you know an over the top one and that's where you do feel hard done to and it's a horrible feeling going to that dressing room after a game where you know one of your teammates I was here at Leeds when Roy Keane did his cruciate and other injuries that you know other times that it's happened in my life and it really does take away and drains the whole dressing room and you could see Jurgen Klopp at the end of that game sat on the bench drinking his drink not interested really in the result the fact his team had played really well more just thinking about he's got that walk back into the change room to see that boy and he knows that's a really bad thing with all the rest of the teammates so we hope for a quick recovery uh, you know the medical advances nowadays the medical sort of uh, quality that's in the game is fantastic and I'm sure we'll see the boy back out on the pitch as soon as possible I'll send him all my best wishes yeah absolutely we all do it all from from Sky Sports um, the uh, the issue really about um the uh, result, really. We, we've talked a lot about, obviously, the detail. But the result has two sides to it. I mean, it's put Liverpool on 10 points, level with Manchester yeah. United and Chelsea. But where do we think it leaves Leeds? I, I was surprised to read that the director of football was talking about second season yes. syndrome after three games. Now they've lost the fourth. Um, they obviously are thinking along those lines, but the fans surely are going to get them out of the predicament that they're in at the moment. Yeah, they've got to forget all that. They yeah. really have got to forget all that and remember what a... Well, they're, com they're a compelling watch. Even when they're getting beat 3-0, they're a compelling watch. And what we've got to be careful of is that we don't demand that they change too much because mm. we enjoy coming watching them play. Marcelo Bielsa's teams are fantastic to watch. Great energy. I do think in the first half there was real desperate... You used the word, I used the word frantic and anxious in the game you use the word at times it looks desperate and I think desperate is probably a more uh, fitting word every time they go forward they look like they have to score within six seconds five seconds three seconds and I know that's a principle that counter-attacking teams have you must damage the other team within three four five seconds but the problem is you've got to assess what is the probability of this attack coming to a goal and what is the probability of this attack coming to nothing and they do try at times to do the impossible on the counter-attack when there's an, like a cross-field pass on to one person against two defenders. There's always a player running in behind, always, and they try and play it every, <coughs> every single time it felt in the first half. And that cost them because it never gave their defenders a chance to rest. So every time they gave the ball away, and I've been there as a defender sometimes when you sort of, you just feel like, you know, to keep the ball for a minute or two. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank said it at half-time. I felt the same thing. They were really, really anxious and frantic and desperate in the play. And they needed composure. And Calvin Phillips is normally that player that brings a bit of composure to it. But he couldn't bring the composure to the game. And Thiago particularly was bringing composure for Liverpool. A lot of people will have switched on to this podcast to hear you talk about the return of Cristiano Ronaldo. So let's, let's get on to that. Um, you weren't there. You were watching Salford. I understand Mrs Neville chose to go to watch Cristiano Ronaldo rather than watch your team. She did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, look, I, I have to say that yesterday I went to take my daughter to play uh, lacrosse in the morning for the school and she came back 12 o'clock. And we walked out into Manchester City Centre where we live and the city, I've not seen it as alive 
as spirited, forget COVID and lockdown, I'm talking for five, ten years. What's, what he's done, not just to Manchester United, and probably to the Premier League as well in terms of the interest and the excitement, but to the city of Manchester, he's absolutely just buzzing with excitement that this great world star... And this was before he scored the two goals. This is before he scored the two goals. Yeah. And then when it came through, I was at Salford watching a nil-nil, <laughs> Uh, and it came through, he'd scored the first, and it came through, he'd scored the second. I could only imagine the atmosphere, and I watched it later on. It was, and, you know, like I say, I spoke to a few people who were there, uh, and they said it was absolutely out of this world, like bouncing, they'd never seen it before. And then I, actually, Sulphur did score in the last minute, which actually meant it was the perfect football day. <laughs> uh, but look, it's absolutely wonderful, Martin, to have him back in the Premier League. We, I said in, after 20 minutes of the first half, I was sat here watching this game, marvelling at the speed the quality the atmosphere and we i said we quite often look back at sort of you know was the game there was more tackling in the 1990s and 80s and it was more real and it was more there was you know there was standing on the terraces honestly what i've seen in this last three or four weeks in the premier league takes some beating in terms of quality obviously with the fact that the atmosphere is back in the stadium because fans have not been in for so long and they're just happy to be back this is as good as i've seen we, we lauded the players last season for being brilliant through COVID in difficult times and all the fans frustratingly having to watch from home. We were in here and it was desperate at times, wasn't it, with the fans not in the stadium and you sort of like, it was another game. But it's more than made up for it at the start of this season. It's a compelling watch. You know, what seeing obviously this stadium, which I had mixed memories of this stadium because it was a hostile stadium, a team I didn't like, a club that didn't like us, uh, no love lost. But you want Leeds in the Premier League. You want this atmosphere in the Premier League. You know, Liverpool, up until that Harvey Elliott incident, would have loved this game today. Mm. They would, it would have really just... You know, it's a brilliant place to play football, as is Anfield, as is a packed Old Trafford and Stamford Bridge and mm. all the other great stadiums that we have. Um, but I do think that it's been a brilliant start to the season. And Cristiano Ronaldo coming back, I think, has just put that little extra cherry on the top of already a very good cake. And Chelsea can point to another return, Romelu Lukaku, who obviously uh, put his imprint on their win at the weekend as well. It was interesting because obviously Newcastle, have, I'd expect Manchester United to beat Newcastle the way in which they did, with or without Ronaldo. Um, but then I went home from Salford to watch the Chelsea-Villa game and Villa played well and Villa are a decent side. But Chelsea, again, just like a robotic, methodical... You know, when he scored that first goal, Lukaku, I just thought, ooh, it's ominous. And there's a feeling about Chelsea, clean sheets, the striker scoring guaranteed, the players in behind them, a good midfield, that they're going to be very difficult to stop. Very, uh, uh, you know, the talk will all be about Manchester, Pep Guardiola's Manchester City, Cristiano Ronaldo, Manchester United, but Chelsea, I think everybody knows they're serious. We've watched them now two or three times, haven't we, this season, and I watched them against Liverpool at Anfield, and it's a real performance. It's just a good team, Good at Arsenal, um, got them against Tottenham next week. They play mm. away from home. That'll be interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, a brilliant Premier League, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to what's going to come in the next few months. We just have to let it develop because obviously, we'll all, everyone's looking to predict the champions this early. A Manchester United winning the title, a Chelsea, a City, but Liverpool are really in it. They really are in it. I can't let you go without talking about what's been a hot potato since we last sat down together. Is this World Cup every two years, the um, idea that's attributed to Arsene Wenger, and he believes that the workplace can accommodate it for professional football. Um, you're very forthright on all these matters. What do you think of it? I've had the presentation. Um, and when someone present, you know, he's been presenting it behind the scenes to people over the last three or four months, there is a logic to it. There is a sense to it. There is a feeling that actually, well, rather than there be an overseas tour for the clubs and, you know, three or four England games or international games in the summer anyway, because you play qualifiers, let's simplify the calendar. It is seen... Um, I think the, the problem it has at the moment is the delivery and execution of it through a time where we've just experienced the Super League and there is a feeling that it's extracting money and it's about money. Mm. I get that, I understand it completely, and we've got to be careful we don't sort of uh, saturate the game and squeeze too much orange out of the juice, uh, sorry, too much juice out of the orange. Um, but there were things like, I don't like the September, October, November breaks for the Premier League. 
I don't like them. Never did. As a player, I don't like them now. I, th I don't feel you get momentum. I don't think the fans like them. Well, we've got another one coming up in three weeks. We've got weeks another time. one in two yeah. weeks. Yeah. You, get, you get three games of Premier League, four games, mm. then you're stopping again. Then another mm. three games, then you're stopping again. And I don't like it. Mm. You know, one of Arsenal's ideas is that you actually put all World Cup qualifiers into a four week period in October, November. And the and basically, you have almost like eight games in a month, nine games in a month, ten games in a month, whatever it is in the qualifying period, it'll be eight or ten. And actually, all World Cup qualification is done in a concentrated period where you've not got all these little mini breaks. You've just got one concentrated period where teams would play, just concentrate purely on, a, on a, uh, an international qualification. I saw merit in that. I saw merit in it from an international point of view that you've got focus for a month with, the, you know, that they're not going, you're not getting them for four days, then they're leaving and going back to the clubs. I saw merit in it from a club point of view that they've got one break rather than these four or five during the season. From a fan's point of view, you could get really behind your country in that month. And then you didn't have to just, you know, think about club, but country. It's like a tournament to qualify yeah. for a tournament. Yeah, and yeah. I, I thought, yeah, I like that. So I wouldn't just dismiss this one out of hand without looking at the proposal because I think there are some good ideas within it and there is a feeling that you know I used to think that it was fair game to play in a World Cup for five six weeks in the summer and the European Championships but then what would happen the summer after you'd have Le Tournoir the Umbro Cup was created all these different tournaments yeah, and in your time the overseas travel for the players with games that are televised so the players are accountable they're not like having a, a warm up at Wigan so to speak no you know? no Abs Marty, absolutely I mean, you're talking about like, yeah. Fabinho and Alisson travelling to Brazil then coming back 15 hours then going back in two weeks 15 hours yeah. then back again that would just be taken away if there was a concentrated period so there are some things within this proposal that actually work forget the money side of things for now and the fact that there is this element of a lack of trust, I think, generally from fans and thinking that, you know, that it's a money grab. I, I get that and I'm, I'm with it and I'm, we've got to be conscious of that. But I also think there are other tournaments that get put in the in-between years sometimes, these friendly tournaments that mean nothing, that players are asked to play in. And I think, well, you might as well have a World Cup as have that. And I do think there are some calendar simplifications that could work for everybody. So... I'm, I'm not saying I'm for it and I'm not saying that I'm against it and that's not me sitting on the fence because ordinarily I would go for it if I thought it was a really bad idea or I thought it was a really good idea. I'm a little bit torn in it in the sense that I do think there's some really good parts to this. It's just the logic of whether does it cheapen or devalue the World Cup and the European Championships, the fact that it's coming round more often. That's the bit that I just want a little bit more thought on. Bielsa, we're here at Leeds, so we'll leave it with a, a comment from him. He thinks the players should play less, which Arsene Wenger may be trying to incorporate in this. It doesn't seem that way, but you've seen the presentation, I haven't. Um, but Bielsa says if there's less matches, players will benefit, uh, the game will lose income because of that. So the players will have to accept that in the benefit of playing and being fresher when they do play and giving us 100% entertainment, no carryovers from a game three days earlier, that they would, that, that has to be balanced out by them getting paid less. Yeah, and I think that, look, Sir Alex Ferguson in 1996, 7, 8 started to build a squad that could cope with four competitions and ultimately it culminated in a treble because he had 22 players and he wanted a top player, a first team player for every position. And every player was, f f because he had the guts and courage to rotate and trust his players, every player got a good amount of football. When I look at these squads that exist now within Premier League clubs, particularly at the top that play European football, they might play 60 games a season, but they've got 24 fantastic players and all the young players as well. So there's no player being asked to play you know, we know there's some freaks out there, you know, your Cristianos and your Messis and some of these players that play every single game. But generally, players can play if they really wanted to, 40, 45 games. So Marco, Marcelo Bielsa could rotate his team a little bit more. You know, he could play some well, of his squad players and he, make sure they only get 40 to 45 games. I, you know, we played 60-odd games. He would argue, look at his squad and look at the substitutes today that included a number of teenagers and players who haven't played in the Premier League, that he couldn't do it. But the top six... And he made that point. The but he's not in Europe. Top six. But he's not, no, in Europe. he's not in Europe. So no. he's got a free week this week. I, yeah. I think teams that are not in Europe, honestly, I don't think you can have any complaints. Mm. You're playing 45, 50 games max. Mm. Max. And that's if you do well in the Cups. Mm. The teams in Europe are the ones that have to have the big squads. And I think they have got big enough squads, those teams, to be able to cope with Europe. You, know, you might get the odd time where Burnley qualify for Europe, as an example, and then they struggle and they're in the Europa League on a Thursday night and it really does decimate their league season. 
But honestly, having played at Manchester United under a manager, I think was a... I can't remember a manager who did it before him, where he rotated his team so much and his strikers. And he put young kids, if you remember, in the, in the League Cup in 1993. And it was actually brought up in Parliament as disrespect to the competition. Because he said, I can't play my first 11 in every single game if I'm going to compete on all fronts. It's now known that Liverpool can bring in um, Origi or Oxlade-Chamberlain or other players if, you know, Jota, if Firmino and Salah and Mane are injured. They've got who came Kater. on, yeah. I mean, yeah. Man I was looking at Manchester United's forward players before. Fernandes, Pogba, Van der Beek, Rashford, Greenwood, Cavani, Ronaldo, Mata, Sancho. I mean, literally there, there's about yeah. 10. Yeah. There's only three playing up front, three or four. So you could argue that if even if two got injured or two had two weeks holiday off, you know, that's what Chris, that's what Cristiano was given by United by Manchester United all those years ago with Nani and with uh, sometimes with Anderson. So Alex would say to them, "Go and have a week away. Go and have ten days away," because he had Jason Park or he had Nani if it was Ronaldo going away. He had Ryan Giggs. He had other players behind that were capable of stepping up to the plate. And I think that if managers really wanted to give players a rest, they could. They could. I, so I'm not buying into that one a little bit because of the amount of players in the squads and the fact that if you're in Europe, you've got 24-man squads. And if you're Leeds, you're not in Europe, you actually are only asked to play 38 league games. And Well, some clubs play cups. 40, 41 games. They get knocked out of both domestic cups and play. They're 38. You know, That's what I'm if you get knocked out of the League yeah. Cup and FA Cup in your league, you play 40 matches. You play 40 matches. Yeah, yeah. 40 matches is, is mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. So I, I, I don't quite buy into it. The principle of playing less football is one that was being touted by Sir Alex Ferguson and other managers 10, 15 years ago. But I do feel as though the fitness, the sports science, the nutrition, the bigger squads, I do feel as though there is a, that they can cope with these 45, 50 game seasons. I do think they can cope. And the, the quality of football we see, I think, tells us that as well. It's a great note to finish on. Positive thinking as always. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Martin. Thanks.